There is a circulation going around of an English version of the announcement of Bin Salman's orders regarding new restrictions during Ramadan in Saudi Arabia. The orders were originally published on the account of the Ministry of Islamic Affairs in Arabic. Although the English is an awkward translation of the Arabic, it nevertheless sets out clearly Bin Salman's decision to restrict Ramadan this year in Saudi Arabia and aligns entirely with his push to oust Islam from the public sphere as part of Vision 2030. Let's go through it. Number one and number two are straightforward. Imam should not be late or absent and the call to prayer should be on time. It's number three where the restrictions begin to emerge. The translated version of the order says, Taking into account people's conditions in Taraweeh prayers, the completion of Tahajjud prayers in the last 10 days of Ramadan, with enough time before Fajr Adhan, so it won't be hardship on the worshippers. You can tell that the document has probably been translated by Sheikh Google, hence the awkward sentence structures. However, you can make out the essence of it. Be mindful of the worshippers during Taraweeh. In other words, don't make it long. And during Tahajjud in the last 10 days, don't make it long. And setting aside any analysis or debate over the reasons for this order for now, and whether it's truly about the welfare of the worshippers, the effect of this order is clear. Shorten the prayers. And keep that in mind as we move on to rule number four, which states, according to the English translation doing the rounds, abiding by the Prophet's guidance in qunut, dua, supplication, at taraweeh prayer, and non-prolongation, and being limited to jawami' dua and the sahih supplications, and avoid hymns and intonation. Despite the awkward translation again, the message, the restriction is clear. Keep the dua and supplication short. That's what they mean by non-prolongation. Moreover, keep the du'as within the remit of sahih supplications or general supplications. In other words, do not add supplications of your own. For context, imams often make supplication for the liberation of Palestine or other issues related to current affairs. The order in this regard is a simple one. Keep it short, stick to the script. So we're up to rule number four and we have shorten the prayers, shorten the du'a and stick rigidly to the script. Let's continue. Rule number five. The importance of reading some useful books on the mosque group according to circulars that regulate that. This is a dark warning from Bin Salman. When Bin Salman changed the education curriculum in Saudi Arabia, he ordered a sweeping reduction in the hours students spend on Quran, Islamic studies and Arabic language. The argument by his supporters was that these hours would be better spent on what they called critical thinking. Scholars who have criticized his de-Islamization of the education system have been tossed into prison, while the Imam of the Holy Mosque in Mecca, Abd al-Rahman al-Sudais, has been deployed by bin Salman on numerous occasions to publicly justify bin Salman's policies in religious terms, including describing Donald Trump at one point as an ambassador of peace. Not only that, Imad al Bayyid, a sheikh in Saudi Arabia, recently posted a video on his Twitter account calling on bin Salman and his right-hand man, Turki al sheikh to fear Allah regarding their attack on the Islamic identity of Saudi via the General Entertainment Authority's aggressive introduction of giant raves and to fear Allah in their education of the new Saudi generation. Very soon after he posted this video, he posted another video, but this time apologizing for any misunderstanding, then tweeted a day later saying that he had safely escaped Saudi Arabia and he was now in a safe place. But the reason I mention this is because the Minister of Islamic Affairs himself, the Minister of the Institution that issued the document of these rules that have been circulating, then gave an interview implicitly referencing Sheikh Imad by the situation and his denouncing of the de-Islamization drive of Turkey al Sheikh's General Entertainment Authority as deviant. Let me make that clearer. Mbayev's condemnation of the giant raves and de-Islamization drive is described by the Minister of Islamic Affairs as deviant. So it tells you a lot about the people who are going to be regulating the literature during Ramadan. So this order may appear like it's nothing. It may appear that it's just about books, but its gravity can only be appreciated in the context within which bin Salman is transforming religious education. This is not a rule or recommendation. It's a warning to toe the increasingly anti-Islamic line. So up to this point, we have shorten the prayers, shorten the dua, stick strictly to the script and use only literature approved under Vision 2030 that does not criticize the de-Islamization drive or the General Entertainment Authority. And here we move to rule number six, which is straightforward. It says, adhering to the directives issued regarding controls for installing cameras in mosques, not using them to photograph the Imam and worshippers during the performance of prayers and not transmitting the prayers or broadcasting them in the media of all kinds. In other words, 
the broadcast of the recitation of the Imam and the prayers of the worshippers is strictly forbidden on all media outlets. So those of you who tune into the accounts of Masjid Quba or other mosques where the legendary Sheikh Muhammad Ayyub rahimahullah was once an Imam in Masjid Quba, he was discovered there. Or those of you who tune into other mosques in the kingdom to listen to an Imam you particularly enjoy listening to, you can no longer do that during Ramadan because they're not allowed to broadcast their recitation. Now think about it. Why would you ban this? If it was for a religious reason, the idea that worship is a private act that should not be broadcast, then why leave an exception for Mecca and Medina, the most holy and sacred places for worship? Why declare it haram or disliked or frowned upon in Islam for the other mosques, but declare it permissible for the two most holy and sacred mosques? In other words, it has nothing to do with worshippers or privacy of worship. So the argument goes out the window and we are back to square one. Why ban the broadcast of the prayers? And the simple answer is that if Bin Salman could silence the two holy mosques, he would. However, the backlash from last year at the suggestion that he was about to do so was such that he is unlikely to want to provoke it again at this moment. In other words, the ban is not about differentiating between some mosques and the holy mosques. It's part of a wider initiative to reduce the volume of Islam in the kingdom while increasing the volume of the giant raves and Vision 2030. And perhaps the easiest way to understand it is to go back to the ban on the use of loudspeakers for mosques that Bin Salman imposed in 2021 and who refuses to lift it even as an exception for Ramadan. The ban states that loudspeakers may only be used at one third of the volume for the call to prayer and is banned entirely from being used to broadcast Quranic recitation even if worshippers struggle to hear the Imam. Bin Salman's supporters insist this is about noise pollution but there's no record of Saudi citizens complaining about the loudspeakers being used for Quranic recitation. In any case, we're only on rule number six, and we already have orders to shorten prayers, shorten the supplications, stick to the script regarding supplications, toe the line on literature, and ensure it does not criticize Turki al Sheikh's General Entertainment Authority, and we have a ban on the broadcast of prayers and recitation, and we have a ban on the use of loudspeakers. We move on to number seven, and it's important to highlight here that this is a false translation of the Arabic version, but first let's read it. That the Imam be responsible for authorizing the I'tikaf, verifying that there are no violations from them, knowing the data of the I'tikaf, and requesting the approval of the sponsor approved for non-Saudis according to the directives issued in advance regarding the I'tikaf controls. This broken English translation has altered the most important part of this rule which is mentioned in the Arabic announcement, which is وَمَعْرِفَةِ الْإِمَامِ لِبَيَانَاتِ الْمُعْتَكِفِينَ this means that the Imam is obliged to collect information on those who are going to perform i'tikaf. For some, this appears normal. An Imam should know who is sleeping in his mosque. However, this is precisely the language that Bin Ali and other authoritarians used to compile a list of zealous Muslims in Tunisia and other places who would then be subject to surveillance and monitoring. The word bayanat is identical to the instructions imposed by other authoritarian regimes who would collect the information of worshippers then subsequently harass them with the ultimate aim of intimidating them from frequenting the mosque and intimidating others by extension from going to the mosque. Now put this rule in the context of Saudi Arabia. Sweeping arrest of imams and religious figures. Abdul Aziz al-Tarifi, Salman al-Uda, Suleyman al-Dawish, Hawad al-Garni, hundreds thrown in prison, sometimes for simply tweeting something that can be construed as criticism. Now imagine the list of worshippers the government will have at the end of Ramadan as a result of the implementation of this rule. In other words, it looks innocent and understandable, but the ramifications are sweeping. So the rule so far, shorten the prayers, shorten the supplications, stick to the script, the, toe the line on literature and do not dare criticize the general entertainment authority or the deismization drive. Broadcaster praise is banned, loudspeakers are banned and you have to hand over your private information when you go to Etikev for the government for monitoring and surveillance. We move to rule number eight. Straightforward, a ban on the collection of donations by mosques. During Ramadan, worshippers often donate on the basis of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said that, some, that someone who feeds a fasting person will receive the reward of the one who has fasted. This rule bans that. Why? Rule number nine bans iftar inside the mosque and restricts it to a section of the courtyard. For context, Muslims during Ramadan would enter the mosque, sit down on the carpet, a sheet would be rolled out in front and dates would be served with drinks to worshippers for them to break their fast. Then the sheets would be rolled up and everyone would stand for prayer. This custom in the mosque made breaking the fast special and is something celebrated by Muslims worldwide. This rule bans this and relegates the iftar to the courtyard of the mosque. However, the rule also stipulates that the experience should not be replicated in the courtyard. Tents or temporary rooms should not be erected. In other words, the iftar should not be something festive and communal in the mosque, but rather a quick enterprise in the courtyard 
after which worshippers then enter the mosque to pray. The rule sounds pedantic. Some suggest it's about cleanliness. However, this has never been a serious problem before. The only possibility, therefore, is that this rule is designed to deflate the vibe of Ramadan that sends worshippers flocking to the mosque for iftar instead of staying at home. It's about toning down Ramadan at the mosque to make it less enticing. So at this point, we have orders to shorten prayers, shorten the supplications, stick to the script on supplications, toe the line on literature, and do not dare criticize the general entertainment authority or the de-Islamization drive. Broadcast of prayers is banned. Loudspeakers are banned. You have to hand over your private information to the state that's already imprisoning religious figures and collecting donations even to feed other fasting worshippers is banned. And that brings us to rule number 10. Don't bring children to the mosques. The rule states, he urged worshippers not to accompany children as this would disturb the worshippers and cause them to lose their reverence. This rule is very similar to Soviet states that often ban children from mosques in order to restrict Islamic influences on the nurturing and upbringing of children in order to raise a generation detached from Islam. Why would you ban kids from Taraweeh in the mosque? Put these restrictions all together now. Shorten the prayer, shorten dua, restrictions on literature, ban on broadcasting prayers on all outlets, collect full information of those who do itikaf in the mosques, the zealous ones, ban on collecting donations, ban on iftar inside the mosque, and ban on putting up tents and restricting iftar to a small part in the courtyard, and ordering worshippers not to bring their kids. Do these restrictions look like they are designed to promote Ramadan as something at the heart of the country's identity, or designed instead to aggressively restrict it?